I imagine a bunch of you are jumping on social media right now to complain about how that ending is not the least bit noir. Well, what can I say? I completely agree. In fact, given the subject matter and the story's bleak and bitter perspective, it's surprising how little of While the City Sleeps feels like film noir. Yet for decades, it's been considered one of the preeminent films noir on Fritz Lang's lengthy resume. I suspect that's because much of the early scholarly writing on noir cited Lang as a primary practitioner of the form which made sense given that German Expressionism had long been credited as the progenitor of the noir visual style. And Lang, during his early days at Ufa Studios in Berlin, created many of those first expressionistic films. His relocation to America so neatly coincided with the development of film noir that he became, to many critics constructing the first studies of noir, the movement's figurehead. In the process, some Lang films were tagged noir that, at least in my opinion, don't really fit the bill. And for me, this is one of them. So why did I choose to show it? Well, it features two personal passions of mine, the newspaper business and comic books. So it's right in my wheelhouse. But I also wanted to show this film because I have a personal connection to it. The author of the original Dell paperback on which it's based, Charles Einstein, was a colleague of my father's. He first worked in Chicago for the International News Service, but in the late 50s, he moved west, taking a job as a sports writer at the San Francisco Examiner, where he became pals with my dad, the paper's boxing expert. In fact, when my father published a collection of his best boxing stories, Charlie Einstein wrote the foreword. Charlie's real passion, though, was baseball. For years, he covered the San Francisco Giants, becoming a confidant and collaborator with the biggest giant of all, Willie Mays. Two of the cherished books of my youth were Mays' memoir, My Life in and Out of Baseball, and the first fireside book of baseball, both co-written and edited by Charlie Einstein. I sometimes wonder if my appreciation of mordant humor wasn't sparked by Charlie, who was a frequent dinner guest at our house. He often talked about his father, Harry Einstein, a comedian who worked under the moniker Park Your Carcass. Charlie loved telling the story of how his father died. He suffered a heart attack at a friar's roast in 1958, and when his table mate, Milton Berle, started shouting, is there a doctor in the house? Nobody responded. They all thought Burl was just doing his usual shtick. Comedy was in the Einstein family's blood. Charlie's half-brothers are veteran comedy writers and performers Albert Brooks and Bob Einstein, who was best known for the character Super Dave Osborne. Yes, that's right. Albert Brooks's real name is Albert Einstein. And now, on a darker note, the actual lipstick killer was apprehended after a six-month manhunt and media circus. He was a 17-year-old student at the University of Chicago named William Hirons, a popular kid with excellent grades who dabbled in petty burglaries. After he was arrested breaking into a house near the site of one of the killings, police charged him with the murder, declaring his fingerprints matched those on a ransom note left at the victim's home. Now, several Chicago papers quickly reported that Hirons had confessed, although he denied any connection to the killings. Now, this being an era before Miranda writes, Hirons was beaten by the cops and repeatedly injected with truth serum until he finally cracked and signed a confession admitting to one of the killings. In short order, he was charged with all three of the lipstick killer's murders. On the advice of lawyers, Hirons pled guilty getting three consecutive life sentences instead of the electric chair. Hirons recanted his confession almost immediately. I lied so I could live, he told the press. Now, all requests for a review of his case were denied multiple times, and Hirons spent the rest of his life, 65 years, in an Illinois prison. He died in 2012 at the age of 83, maintaining his innocence until the end. Next week, I'll be making a long haul to my hometown, where I will deliver to your doorstep 
a film still perfectly fresh after 70 years on the market. Be here when Noir Alley presents Richard Conti, Valentina Corteza, and Lee J. Cobb in Thieves Highway, directed by the great Jules Dassin. It's a movie with a lot of personal significance for me, and not just because Valentina was once the apple of my eye. Keep up the conversation on our Facebook page and Twitter feed, and until next week, I'll be right here working the graveyard shift so we can get the next edition put to bed.